Howdy, Ando here from Happy Life Martial Arts. Welcome to episode number 77 of Fight for a Happy Life, the show that believes even a little martial arts makes life a whole lot better. Today, a conversation with Mr. Paul Reed. Paul is a lifelong martial artist who is currently practicing and teaching out of England and Spain. Paul is more commonly known as the Teapot Monk, which makes him the founder of the Teapot Temple. And the Teapot Temple, in Paul's own words, produces mold-breaking online 21st century Tai Chi courses. Paul has also shared his wisdom in books, videos, and podcasts. But that's not the reason I wanted to talk to him. The real reason that I'm a fan of Paul's is his style. Paul has truly found a way to express himself, to put art into his martial arts. Some may find his approach to Tai Chi unorthodox. Some might find it offensive. Some others might even find it heretical. But Paul would simply say it's an amusing alternative to the norm. So, hey, make a fresh pot of tea and let's meet the monk. Mr. Paul Reed, welcome to the show, sir. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me on. I am uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity of not only getting to know you a little bit with more depth, but an opportunity of having a conversation with you after so many years of uh, only dreaming that one day I would have this opportunity. <laughs> well, that's creepy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we've been bumping into each other on social media for years, and this is long overdue, so thank you for making some time today. We have, uh, haven't we? We've stumbled across each other in many different platforms. Indeed, yeah, and I'm a fan, so uh, this is really a, an honor. Um, the name of the show is Fight for a Happy Life, so I usually like to ask people, uh, how do you define a happy life, and how is your fight going, sir? Okay, that's a great question. I love that. It brings yeah. up a couple of really important issues for me, one of which is, what is happiness? What do we mean by that? Is that a goal that we can get to somehow? Is it a pathway? Is it the journey? Is it the end, the arrival? Who knows what it is? I think part of what I've been trying to do for some time now has been replace the idea of happiness in my life, which may sound a bit sad, but it's not. Wait till you get to the end. Okay. With the idea of purpose or, or meaning, because I suppose happiness is something for me that surges spontaneously from the ground like a spring in an unexpected moment in a way. Mm. And the more I try and put it on a spreadsheet that it's something I can achieve if I follow this sequence of mm, to do's, the more I get uh, frustrated. There was an incident last week um, talking about social media platforms with you on I think it was last week on Instagram where I, I photographed a rainbow. And it was down as I, I live on the coast here and I was walking along the sea wall and uh, the clouds parted in some sort of biblical way. And for the mo for that brief moment, a rainbow appeared in the centre of the ocean and it ended just at the path in front of me. And obviously I suddenly thought pot of gold. Fantastic. I'm going to go and grab this. And as I ran towards it, obviously, the end of the rainbow moved away proportionately to how close I got to it. And I realized that was a bit like this pursuing, you know, business. It, perhaps that's what always happens when we try and fix goals somewhere. And the nearer, the harder we try to achieve them, the more distance we, we place between ourselves and that, and that final, final uh, object. So uh, I'll stop there, I think. Before no, that's, I, I think that's pretty profound right there. off the bat. I think you stopped the show right there. Thanks for coming on. That was uh, great seeing you next time. <laughs> that's a lot to think about. So maybe happiness is not something you can access directly. You have to find some other way in. So um, a purpose would be what you have figured out. So what is your purpose then? What have you nailed down at this point in your life? What's your purpose? Oh, well, I was hoping you won't get to that bit, but <laughs> you have, and this is going to go out now. I don't really know, and I think one of the things that's affecting me as I get older, I'm becoming aware of this on an almost daily basis, is that the things I, I knew yesterday, I have serious doubts about today. 
So like when I agreed to do this podcast, for example, a week ago, today I woke up and thought, what have I done? What was that about? <laughs> so I'm, there's always this doubt in the back of my mind about stuff I thought I knew. Uh, I keep questioning it. And the older I get, the more I'm aware of the fact that I've got too many questions now. And it immobilizes me to some extent, if you wow. know what I mean. So what is that purpose now? I think it is going back to the idea of uh, as I've got older and I've left behind some of the more harder activities, the more strenuous activities in my life where I've been chasing those pots of gold at the rainbow, at the end of the rainbow. Um, as I leave those behind more and more, I feel that the, the, the present discipline that I'm most involved in, which is Tai Chi and the underlying philosophy to that, is something that only gets deeper and more profound and more challenging as I get older and it's a discipline in which I feel that my proficiency in it only increases with age as opposed to for example had I continued my taekwondo training when I was 17 I'm sure by now I would be having to seriously reconsider my training schedule so that in a sense is what I'm trying to do I'm trying to promote this approach to the martial arts that is a softer, more inclusive, um, and hopefully something isn't affected so much by achy joints and age. That's excellent. So the purpose, okay, so start off with you saying that uh, you're not really sure about your purpose, but you do know that the Tai Chi or your expression of martial arts at this point in your life is definitely part of what's going to take you to the end of your life here. That is definitely something that's helping you at least point towards a purpose, whether that's just learning as a student or teaching, sharing it. Um, so somewhere in the martial arts, you found a purpose, even though it's not completely crystallized as such. Is that fair? I think that's fair. I think it's more it's we're going back to this idea of paths rather than end points, you know, nice. rather than arrivals. It's still going back to this idea of the journey in some vague mystical nonsensical way that <laughs> sounds good but in practice it doesn't work nice. i like that yeah the journey is the purpose i think that might be a relief to many people uh, listening maybe it's just me um finding a clear purpose is difficult i mean if you're a real zealot uh, then you kind of can, can become crazy um but when you start being yeah. blinded to other opportunities yeah. or growth or learning so to um always leave one foot outside of what you're doing and say, well, let me take another look at this. Am I reevaluate, make sure I'm on the right path using my abilities um, as such. Um, I think that's kind of a relief that because you seem to maybe be one year older than I am or something like that. Um, just to know if there's any angst or anxiety about, oh my gosh, I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing, that then maybe never ends and that's okay. It's not about like, I like that, not the end point, but just the path that you're on. I know I'm heading in the right direction and I'm not sure where it's going to end up. And maybe we're not supposed to. Maybe that's part of the journey. Yeah. And even if the compass is not working as it should and you're drifting about zigzagging your way across, then maybe that's all part of that process as well. I mean, there's nothing worse than being on a direct straight motorway that doesn't ever veer away from one straight line for the next four hours give right. me that back road that's curvy and right. passes the brook the stream and under the tree that i can pull over and you know enjoy a, a little bit of a time out so yeah slow down enjoy it love that i love that it actually ties into this quote that i found um yeah well it's not one of mine is it <laughs> oh yes Oh, yeah, I'd like to read you some of my quotes. <laughs> I'd like you to read some more of my quotes throughout this program. <laughs> um, uh, on the subject of being a teacher, uh, you have this quote about uh, right when you recommended to other people how to find a good teacher. You said uh, to uh, find someone who knows how to listen in a world that seems to only want to talk. Um, uh, so that's great, because if you already had everything figured out, then you would just be talking, talking, talking. So clearly you you put a high value on the still the listening part of it, the learning part of it. So how do you find that balance uh, for yourself as a teacher and a student? How do you break up your time or how do you know when you've gone too far one way and not the other? Uh, how do you find that balance? I think of, of the the, I, the, con, the the discussion points that we were we were exchanging before we began this um this 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 talk well, that was this is without doubt the most 
complex, I think. It, it contains a lot within it. What do we mean by listening? What do we mean by, you know, it get, even it goes to the heart of what it is to teach and how we teach effectively, as opposed to merely reproduce ourselves in varied forms in exchange for a payment at the end of the day. So this idea of, of, of listening and talking really goes down to the, the fundamental basics of how we effectively communicate and convey our skills to others so that they in turn can use them in a, mo in a means that's most appropriate for them, not merely as reproductions of yourself. So uh, how do we do that? Well, one of those, I used to teach languages abroad. I, be, I was living in Spain for 21 years up until a couple of years ago, I came back to the UK. And during that time when I was teaching there, I recognized that the way people learned languages was in a series of different ways. And it, it depended on them as individuals. Some of them needed to see the word spelt out. Otherwise, they couldn't they couldn't grasp it. Doesn't they couldn't just hear it and reproduce it. They needed to see the letters, the structure of it, the formation of it. Others that didn't help at all. In fact, it was a diversion. They just needed to listen and respond. Others needed to use it. They need to just employ it in some form, stick it in a in a sentence or a phrase and get on with it. And so it it overlapped into the, the my Tai Chi teaching there as well because I was teaching in Spanish to uh, an audience of Spaniards and my first language is not Spanish. And so I was constantly questioning whether or not I was conveying concepts well and how, and I discovered it wasn't so much about me, it was more about awareness of where they were. Some of them needed to see the move they needed to see brush knee and push. They needed to see repulse tiger. They needed to see me do it again and again and again and again from every different angle. Mm -hmm. They'd walk around me taking notes. You know, other people, they were happy to do it alongside me. They didn't even need to see it. They felt it. Other people needed to question me over it and say, if your right hand is here, the middle finger is approximately level with your bottom lip at about six to eight inches. Is that right? And I would say, well, maybe. And they would more or less get out a ruler to measure it. There are those people that need that mechanical structure. And so everyone had a different approach to it. And I felt that the difference between listening and talking was if you could go into a class as a teacher without an agenda, without a strict agenda, you gave yourself the space to watch and to hear and not always to participate, not always to demonstrate, but just to look and respond to what was going on. Sometimes that would be speaking, sometimes it would be demonstrating, sometimes it would be adding a little touch to an elbow and move it out to the side and bring it a hand back in. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is that I don't think there's a, there's a, a, a definition that's useful here. If anything is useful for many of this is really just to give ourselves the space to slow down, to step back, to pull back and maybe just observe more and respond to the needs of each student so that they can fulfill themselves rather than merely reproduce the pattern of moves that you're demonstrating. Does that make any sense? That all makes perfect sense. Uh, I love every part of that. I mean, from a self-defense aspect, you're also training yourself. You're a good teacher and a good student and allowing that space so you can respond appropriately. Then from a self-defense point of view, fantastic, because you're not just looking at every single aggression, like, oh, here's how I respond. I do one, two, three. Every situation is different. There's a time to walk away. There's a time to fight. So uh, you're already building that habit into your teaching style, your learning style. Um, how you'd respond in a self-defense situation. Um, and I like, I mean, I've heard you say, I believe in other places that it's not the positions, it's the space between the positions. Um, and that just mm -hmm. ties to what, what you're saying again, that the, this appreciation of the space, of the quiet. Um, let's have a moment of quiet right now. Go on then, when you're ready, hang on. Beautiful. I feel everyone just learned more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, that, really, that was amazing. That's master level teaching uh, insight there. Because um, some teachers, I know that you studied <laughs> many, many styles, uh, not just of Tai Chi, but styles outside of Tai Chi early on. Um, and you had some problems with that, or at least your teachers had problems with that, because perhaps they did have one 
<laughs> rigid way of doing the art or teaching the art. Um, but early on, you seemed that you had an appreciation for playing with the art from different points of view. Do you still feel that uh, you were justified in annoying your teachers by being open-minded or do you have more respect now for them trying to do things one way first and then let you develop uh, in the future? Do you look back at the way you approached your learning early on differently now or is that still the same attitude? Yeah, uh, I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't know whether or not the world is still like this. I, I, my only, because my focus for the last year and a half has been predominantly online, I I've, I've physically moved myself away from a localized teaching setup. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure whether, and, and I was teaching, as I said, for 21 years in, in Spain, so I don't know what the situation like that now. It's been a long time since I've been teaching in a in a country that I'm more familiar with linguistically, culturally, historically. But back then, we're talking in the 70s and 80s, particularly in the 80s when I was, I was beginning to teach myself. Um, yeah, I ended up not telling people. I, you know, I'm sure we all did this to some extent. You just don't tell your instructor that you're also training with their competitor around the corner and hope that it never cuts back and that was the only way I could I could continue to work with those people because of that reluctance to embrace anything other than their own rituals right. now whether or not that's still the case I don't know whether or not I think that's a good thing I'm not sure I always I always relate this to other disciplines and that is going back again to the idea of languages. When I studied Spanish uh, as a language, I went to university and as someone who had no background in languages, I was taken on and I did a joint course with that information technology. But anyway, the people I were, were studying alongside were language students and they would study mm, Spanish, Italian and French. That was their combined degree course. Now, at no point did they ever tell me that they were sitting in a class of French and were being asked questions in French and they would respond in Spanish or German. There was never a confusion there. They were able to cope with very similar disciplines, but maintain separate areas of study. Similarly, if you're a music student and you go in and you learn I don't know, violin and cello at the same time, I'm not sure that you're going to get that confused and you're suddenly going to try and get a cello underneath your neck or you're going to play a little violin. You've got the capacity. We have the capacity to learn different things at the same time without getting too confused. And I still feel that we're all capable of learning two or three styles at the same time to the point of which we can then determine whether or not that's the style that's appropriate for us. I'm not saying that we will achieve mastership in this within the same period of time. At some point, I think something will drop away. But I still like to encourage students to broaden their curriculum rather than restrict it. Sure. Uh, I suppose that's like if you're a parent and you have, a, you have your child and you don't just say, OK, well, you're playing soccer. That's it. Or football. Um, and you never let them try any other sport that they might have more fun in or be better at. You try, I think, as a good parent to let your child try many, many different things and kind of let that sift out to find out, oh, there you are. You enjoy that and you're pretty good at that one. I think that will be your vessel for confidence building and character building. Let's stick there. Um, where some people I see, that's it. You got you got stuck into one activity early on. Maybe you hated it. So you dropped it and you never tried anything else. And then or, um, well, you know what I'm saying? It's like it's it's a good sure. philosophy as a parent and it's a good philosophy to treat yourself as you're raising yourself to sample everything a little bit and um, don't be closed minded too early. I think later on it's good to get closed minded, <laughs> but early on, it's like, yeah, well, let me take a look around, make sure I'm making a, a pretty good investment early. Uh, otherwise so, you could have, have, have go on then, go on then. Now, now you've thrown it to me. I'm just going to push it back on you. How do you deal with <laughs> students in your class that come along and say, and though, you know, this is brilliant. Uh, and I've been training with such a such. You showed me this. What do you think? What, what's your response? Um, if, if a student is studying something different, you mean? Oh, no, similar, similar. 
Similar is a problem. I mean, to me, a cello, violin, a fingering, there's some similarities there that carry over. I don't mind at all if a child saying, well, I'm playing basketball and I'm doing karate. Fantastic. Footwork, keep your hands up, uh, distance management, uh, quick reactions, hand-eye coordination. Those things overlap really, really well. But if someone's coming in saying, oh, I do taekwondo and I do Ishinru karate and I think I'm going to take up kempo and one person's teaching punching this way and one's this way, one's this way, that's a problem because then you really lose the ability to start forming habits, build confidence, uh, you know, make that motor motor skill consistent. And that, I think, opens up the door to injuries or doubts or frustrations because you'll never even take those first steps of, of uh, competence. Right. So um, I think it's a careful curating of what are you cross-training in. Early on, my first start was Taekwondo, but I was also cross-training in Aikido pretty pretty quickly. And they were so different in their approaches, mm. I didn't find them to be a conflict at all. Mm. Uh, but it would have been a problem if I was studying, you know, Shotokan and Taekwondo at the same time. Mm. Well, actually, they were pretty. ITF is pretty similar to Shotokan, but there were some differences, sine waves, stuff like that, that would have been very confusing to me. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I suppose I, I, I find with this argument that there is, it, it comes back to. Yes, I agree with you. There can be areas of overlap. There can be areas of confusion amongst students who are new to these moves and may not be able to ingest them in a way that's useful. It may just confuse, and I'm conscious of that. But there is, on the other hand, there is a way of teaching that's not very healthy, which is to ensure that students don't go beyond the, the frontiers of the school premises you know they never go and look at anything else they never expose themselves to other influences and so the style and everything within it stays very stagnant in a in a sense you know it's very insular and that in tai chi particularly when i first started learning in the 80s was very prevalent in london and there was this um, com Petition between everybody and distrust between everybody, wow. despite the fact we all share far more in common than we have uh, that separates us. That oh, sense, of, and part of me felt very cynical. You know, it's just like, why, why are you telling me this? Is it just because you want to hang on to your students? Is it just because you know you don't want to lose them? Is that the the end goal that worries you? Mm -hmm. that you're worried about losing them to someone else who may offer something not necessarily better or worse but just different so part of me still has that cynical part of my my head somewhere going well you know yes but it's still you know this is the way styles develop isn't it this is the way that the the, the martial arts evolve by exposing ourselves to stuff that that sits outside of what's comfortable with us mm -hmm. I love Isn't that you're it? revealing the dark underbelly of Tai Chi. People think of it just <laughs> as the hospital programs where everyone's happy and in harmony. And, uh, oh, no, uh, are you telling me if there are ego and politics and all that nonsense in Tai Chi world? What? Oh, what? Huh. Never. Yeah, back in the 80s, it was uh, it was it was uh, top of the building, death, death fights, you know, and the, the loser gets tossed off into the alleys below. <laughs> oh, I wish we had video of all of that. Um, I'll have something somewhere. I'll dig it out. And, uh, although, I mean, so I, I lost you. As I've gotten older, um, when you talk about like traditional martial arts or dogma, and I know you spent much time poking some fun at, at those types of uh, ideologies. Um, yeah. But as I've gotten older, yeah. I also appreciate that you can't yeah. really reach deeper and deeper levels until you kind of double down into at least something for a while. Uh, there are a lot of dilettantes, I think, in many arts where uh, it's very common where people will say, oh, I did six months of this and 12 months of that, and now I've created my own style. And um, say, oh, I got the best of Kempo, and I took the best of this art. And you're like, well, mm -hmm. don't tell me. <laughs> you know, it's really arrogant of you to think that you took the best of or you understood what was going on when you were taking mm -hmm. beginner-level stuff yeah. And then I judged it and criticized it, changed it, and you never really got to the end of what that of that learning progression was set up for you. You didn't mm -hmm. get there. So mm -hmm. it's a little premature to be jumping out and saying, well, this wasn't working and that's not good. And like even like sitting in a horse dance or something like that in the Kung Fu world, um, 
you know, you, you see people criticize that kind of, oh, it's sitting in a horse dance, you don't use that in a fight, that, that, that. And it's like, well, yes, you do. It's just you don't understand it yet. <laughs> um, in some lessons, you just have to shut up and have faith and trust, which is scary, perhaps. And for um, free thinkers, it's like almost like the opposite of what you're trying to do. Like, no, no, I'm doing my own thing here, baby. I don't trust. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but uh, you know, Ando, you, you, what you're not, what you're saying is not that you know you you shouldn't you, you can't do these things, but the, they'll come. There, a truth will be revealed at some point in the training that may not be apparent at the beginning, but. Mm -hmm is there inherent in the art that you need to work through until you reach this stage in which you are ready to absorb that truth. But that truth cannot appear to you beforehand. Whereas I, I think I believe that that may or may not be the case. I don't know. Part of me feels it isn't, but part of me is prepared to agree with you because it's your show. <laughs> so <laughs> what, what, what would help me agree with you more i think is the idea that the instructor would allow that process to come out at an early stage and encourage it almost and give reasons why it's useful not to investigate too deeply here or to probe too deeply there because at this stage you will then achieve this in, in my background that's not been the case people have just very much said you would not understand yet, wait till you get to your black belt and then it'll all make sense. And that was never good enough for me. I mean, it may have been good enough in a culture in in the East, which is one about deference and one about respect and one about never questioning that position of authority in that very strong hierarchy. But we don't live in a world with, with those same conditions. We have exported a, a cultural activity to another part of the planet in which people are more used to throwing out questions and saying, and though, but why can't I ever move on beyond the horse dance? And, you know, would hope that you will be able to give them a, a, a good answer. That would be, I think, the only difference there. Um, <clears throat> I, I, too, like in early on in Taekwondo, when you have all these forms and you've got all these very bizarre hand positions and, and, and uh, postures. Well, what is this? Well, someday I will tell you someday. Um, or well, how, how did how did you? Why are we doing this? It this seems ridiculous. I've never been in this situation in a real fight. Trust me, it's it's coming, but I can't tell you yet. You, you don't deserve it yet. That kind of mindset definitely pushes people away. Mm -hmm. um, however, yes, to be a good teacher, a great teacher, <clears throat> I think you would have to be able to uh, have a better explanation right up front. Hey, why is my hand on my hip? Well, you know what? Uh, that's actually grappling type of skill. We're going to be pulling something in, but that's not your level yet. Just practice this body movement first, and then uh, a year from now, we're going to really get into more techniques where you're going to be grappling with that. If you get an explanation like that, they say, oh, okay, it's easier to have faith now because you've made it easier for me. Or certainly if your teacher is able to demonstrate skills that you cannot do, and they tell you, here's how I did it, just trust me, sit in that horse dance for a while, and then you'll be able to do this thing that you see. That, those are both pretty good ways of doing it, either explaining or by demonstrating. But I think the problem, at least when I was coming up, was that you would find some teachers who would just be sitting, watching, and not explaining. So you didn't quite see it. <laughs> you saw there were pictures on the wall of them doing something marvelous. Or you heard legends about, oh, you should have seen them back in the day. Uh, and they wouldn't explain anything. So you were just there as a creature of faith. And that, I agree, just for any human being in any culture is... That's a that's a horribly powerless position uh, to be in as a student. So yes, I think nowadays uh, cats are out of the bag a lot uh, in a lot of places. So you should have a very accessible um, teaching manner that allows people to see what you can do, so they understand what an end point is, or at least what your stage of the journey is, and um, and some basic explanations to say this looks ridiculous now. Call it what it is. This looks absurd. This doesn't look like fighting. However or spiritual uh, awakening or whatever it is your goal is. But this is the tool that I use to get there. So put some faith in this, give me some time and see if you progress the way I did. And if you don't, then I'm more than happy because I care about you to go mm -hmm. try a different methodology, pick up a different tool, that's, mm -hmm. that's fine by me. So I think mm -hmm. we could probably agree that would be the, that's sane, yeah? 
yeah. healthy approach. Yeah, I mean that that brings up that idea about um, demonstrations that I was going to ask you about because I've heard you talk about this before about when someone questions why we're doing something or uh, how we should do something, then to what extent do you, when you demonstrate, are you demonstrating at the capacity, at the, at the level of that questioner? And to what extent are you demonstrating at the level of your ability? Because the example you just gave was you wanted to give someone an idea of what they might be able to do at some point in the future. Whereas, uh, I think this is a difficulty for teachers a lot, that when they're asked to do demonstrations of anything, that they address it to their level as opposed to the level of the student. Is that making any sense? Let me uh, give you a concrete example. There's a posture in Tai Chi called snake creeps through the grass. Snake creeps through the grass. And it's one in which you squat down um, very low, uh, with the right hand in the crane position coming up here and you're, you're so much so that it's said that to do it well, you should be able to pick up a coin off the ground with your mouth. Now, I don't think I've ever been able to do that. And I always consider myself fairly flexible in earlier, earlier parts of my life. And when I have been able to get that low, I felt my right knee, you know, dislocating and my back getting out really bad stuff but almost every tai chi teacher when demonstrating that move will go as low as they can because it looks good it's impressive it brings up the whole you know wow look at that that's what i want to be able to do even though you know your average student is about 77 and can barely sort of bend their knees but there is a sense in which the instructors demonstrate, and I always think this this reminds me over and over and over again, we have a tendency to demonstrate to our own ability and not to where the student is. And if the student's, if the student's got an artificial knee, then it's no good bending down to that point. You, what you want to do is show them how they are able to do it. So going back to your, your example just a moment ago, when your student's saying to you, and uh, but why am I doing this? Why this? And you, so you're going to go, hey, you're doing it because of this, and you demonstrate this move. Are you going to demonstrate it in relation to where you think they are and where you think they will be? Or are you demonstrating it because... That's the move that got you to win that trophy with the certificate still on the wall up there behind you, just above the samurai sword. <laughs> oh, that's just uh, that's just art. I have no certificates or awards, that's for sure. No trophies, sir. I have to buy my swords. Yeah, uh, yeah, they're in the drawer. They're in the drawer. I saw you put them away before we came on. <laughs> that's right. Um, well, certainly if, um, if someone has an artificial knee, I'm not going to limp around and try to move like they do. Say, oh, here, look, this is what you're. That's what you should be doing. Um, and I would also say that um, my goal uh, as a teacher, the things that I'm interested in teaching, aren't uh, oh, look like this. It's feel something. So hey, if you right. grab me, there should be a feeling. Uh, it's I don't really care about how high or how low. That's obviously going to be dependent on the person's capabilities. But we're only the movements are not the point, right? It's the feelings and the development that you're going through while you're performing these movements. That's just the boat that gets you across. A form is a chosen tool, one way to develop yourself. You don't have to do that form. That's why there's so many different forms and so many different styles. Uh, it could be any series of movements. I mean, unless you want to get into meridians and there's certain reasons why certain things are at angles. Okay, well now we're into a qigong discussion. But if we're just talking about basic martial arts thinking, the form is just a tool. And um, it's who you become in working with that tool that matters. So what you're demonstrating isn't necessarily if I'm 80 and I have a bad knee and my back's out and blind in one eye and I lost an arm in a shark attack. Um, I should still be able to demonstrate. I've taught that guy. I've taught that guy. <laughs> He's out there. Um, uh, I should still be able to demonstrate a particular peace of mind or focus or intensity uh, or creativity or um, a body feel that people sense and uh, aspire to uh, go to go towards if you have a teacher who can't demonstrate something and again i'm not talking about you know oh look you can kick over your head because that's a very short period of time where you able to do things like that and that's if you're athletic to begin with 
I'm not particularly athletic, so I don't have videos of me doing, oh, acrobatic kicks in the water bottle challenge. Like, that's not my bag. What I'm trying to demonstrate like with a podcast like this is the, uh, the character building that you can go through and how your life can change uh, through this tool of martial arts, which tools you use within that category of martial arts is you know, much less important than just saying, look, find some way to fight. Fight your balance, fight gravity, fight age, fight flexibility, fight with other people. That fighting brings up so much in you that you can apply to the rest of your life. That's the point. Um, so I don't get, I wouldn't um, put a put a, a negative tone on like, well, I can't pick up a coin off the ground with my mouth. If I have a student who's expecting me to do that, well, then they will definitely need to go find another teacher because I'm not going to show them that. But if they see me trying to do that, if that's the tool that we're, we're talking about, like, oh, let's all work on that together. Uh, and they can trust me as a guide to say, well, here's how far I've gotten and here are the ways I've been injured and here's the safe ways to do this. Um, here's what I'm getting out of that for the rest of my life in terms of flexibility or posturing or breathing or what I have to do mechanically with myself. There's still so many great lessons there to learn um, that it's absolutely still valuable uh, and worth it. So I don't know. I, that I think this is this is I mean, I love hearing all this and I'm totally you know, I'm just excited to hear you saying those things, because in the in the world of Tai Chi, where I think what's different about some of the Chinese uh, martial arts compared to the uh, Japanese arts is there is a. Well, particularly in, in Tai Chi, I suppose, and in Bagwan, Singi, the three internal arts, these have an obsession about forms. They have an obsession in the way that the Japanese structures uh, employ them, as you've so succinctly put, as mere tools, as part of your tool bag. It could be a form, it could be committed, it could be sparring, it could be a whole range of different tools. Whereas I think in Tai Chi, we have developed an a uh, rather anal obsession with this this structure that we have in we've in placed we on top of it a whole series of benefits that are dubious at best certainly questionable for most of us as to whether or not these things actually exist within it and it's almost it's almost overtaken every other aspect of the art i've been to many a class back in the United Kingdom since I moved back a couple of years ago, where there's virtually no partnership work, partner work at all in the class. It's pure form. It's pure solo activity. There's not even conversation going on, let alone laughter or jokes going backwards or forwards. Nothing. You know, it's such a monastic, insular, unhealthy environment to, to work in. So I think we have more work to do in those internal arts to com combat that notion that, listen, we're dealing with merely one tool amongst others here. It's just a structure. Don't place too much emphasis on it. Discard it. Throw it away if it's not working for you. Pick up something else. Absolutely. But it's more difficult, I think. In the Chinese arts, it's much more difficult, and particularly in the, what's called the internal arts, because of this, a lot of uh, spiel, a lot of, a lot of Hyperlatives around the benefits, the so-called benefits, particularly the spiritual benefits of practice, which tend to get in the way sometimes of some of the more practical stuff. But anyway, I'm waffling. No, not at all. Um, yeah, this also, I guess, goes back to just what the student's goal is. I mean, as you've talked about in other places, everybody's coming into this with a different idea of what they want. So if someone's looking for self-defense, strictly that, that's very different than someone just trying to get more flexibility in their older age. Um, that's very different from someone looking for spiritual enlightenment. These are totally different uh, you know, goals. So they're going to, of course, be attracted to a different type of teacher who can demonstrate a different type of thing. Um, mm. But I would totally mm. agree that the partner work is really important for martial arts. Uh, I just recently put up a thing on my Instagram about if you're not, if you take the fighting out of martial arts, it's not martial arts, it's martial arts and crafts. Um, and that's not to make fun of anybody, but that's got quite, that's quite, quite, quite a catchy sound though, too, isn't it? I yeah. might use that. If you don't mind. Sure. <laughs> but um, the uh, it's because to me the the reason I'm proud of being a martial artist is that you can engage with other people differently than I used to. Um, if it's just a monastic, uh, you know, solo activity, um, to me that's not the point of martial arts. The martial arts is usually I say it's it's two goals. First is the controlling yourself. And then second is trying to control someone else, particularly a bad guy who's trying to hurt you. Yeah. But in learning how to yeah. control someone 
who's against you, it makes it so much easier to work with people who are with you. Or it turns someone who's against you into someone who's with you because you've you've gotten past so much of your egos and fears. Um, so to me, I'm always I, I'm glad to hear you say because I wasn't sure from some of your video offerings. Um, gee, how often do you guys do push hands or partner work or do you touch each other ever? Um, because I, I love your videos, uh, slow motion on the beaches and swords and it's it's gorgeous. I'm like. I wonder if he. I wonder if he's got partners. I wonder if he's working out with anybody. Is he a dog? What, who's he working with over there? Um, because Tai Chi, in particular, you always see the uh, the medical commercials, and there's always 30 people in the park, and they're all not looking at each other, not talking to each other. They're all just quietly moving with each other, which is absolutely necessary. That's big half of the goal, you know, controlling yourself. But unless you're adding that second part of controlling or working with someone else, I'm not sure it's martial arts anymore um, because it takes I mean, there's the fight within and there's the fight without. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. And so you do make sure that your students, if you're working with people, uh, do partner up. That's true. Yeah. So what's online? <laughs> and what do we do? You're an online well, teacher primarily now. So how do you encourage people to find that interaction when they're an online student? Well, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you've raised there, and though, which, you know, the whole notion of control about how we control ourselves or other people, or should we even be trying to do that? And if so, for what purpose? And is that in a world in which we're dominated by large conglomerate organizations whose sole purpose is to amass control, is the best response to that to replicate that philosophy on a small scale individually? Um, and part of me has doubts about all of this, not that I think it, it, it makes much sense outside of a, an abstract conversation, but part of what attracts me to Tai Chi is the underlying philosophy of Taoism, something that's very broad, something that's very open to interpretation, and something that almost everyone who ever reads anything about it has a completely different understanding of it to the person next door who's read exactly the same text, but comes up with a different version. Mm -hmm. Part of the beauty of that is its openness to interpretation. It, it goes back to what you're looking for individually. But it is means that anyone can say it means anything and get away with it. That's the disadvantage. But but what I'm saying is that part of it, part of its appeal to me is that it questions those very notions about control why we're looking for control in our lives is it because we live in such fear most of the time and we live in a world in which we have so little control over anything that we do that we have to devote so much of our lives to being able to control our bodies or to control the relationship between another person who we may not see eye to eye with and we need to be able to ensure that we will come out on top of that situation if it escalates to that point. So there's lots of abstract, you know, discussions here that I think are fascinating. And, you know, we could probably talk for months on this issue. Um, but, but you ended up asking about online work. So most uh, people who come to my online um, workshops and courses are supplementing their classes elsewhere. They're using it as an additional resource. There is a second group of people that cannot find a school anywhere within their vicinity, and it would require them traveling hundreds of miles to get to one. So it's so far out the question. They do nothing or they do something with me online or one of the other online teachers. And in the third case, it's people who are, let's just say, of advanced years who are desperately looking to maintain learning some new body mind skill, mm -hmm. but don't quite feel comfortable going into a class of 20 year olds and struggling back into the what they you know they've often had a martial background of some kind but they don't wish to repeat that process again from scratch and they would rather learn sword or something in the privacy of their own garage uh, just to keep them on their toes 
uh, to learn something new, something that feeds into the same philosophy, ideals, keeps them moving, keeps them agile, keeps them you know, that sort of stuff. So, yes, it doesn't reproduce that partnership work, it's, but it's a, it's another thing altogether. It's not meant to reproduce the the, the class situation. Okay. Do I pass? Is that a good enough answer? <laughs> Uh, let me reserve judgment. I'm going to review that tape. Uh, and see what happens there on see that. if you edit that out or not. <laughs> um, I did want to, um, as I said in the intro to this, um, that I'm <sighs> uh, based on the fact that everything you've put out is so very uh, unique. You really have put the art into your martial arts. And uh, it's always amusing to me because I think everybody always agrees like, oh, yes, it's about expressing yourself. We love hearing Bruce Lee talk about express yourself. But the minute anybody says, oh, I made my, my own style or I made up my own form or, hey, I, I do. People go, hey, what do you, who do you think you are? What's, what, are you, what are you crazy? So um, did you always find it so comfortable to find your own voice in the martial arts, to stand on your own and say, well, I'm going to do it this way? Is that, or is that something that kind of evolved over time? Have you gotten more and more brazen uh, over the years? Where does this artistic I, part come from? I think there's two elements to that. There's the first, where do you get the, 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 the brazen quality? Where do you get the self-confidence to stand up and say, well, you know, I may not be the... I may not have many trophies on my shelf. I may not have any many certificates up there. I haven't won any world titles. Um, I don't even have a, a gi or a uniform. I don't have a lot of hair. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm 60 years old. I've got you know, you know I've got a, a half a dozen books that have not been bestsellers, and uh, and I've been writing about it for a lot while. That doesn't give me the credibility in traditional circles to stand up and say. Ah, I've knocked up my own form and anyone can come and do it. But I've done that and I've done it with the aim of trying to encourage other people to do the same because I believe that's the way that we evolve as a, as a practice. Anyone can do that at pretty much any level and I think that's down to the down to the re response of other people to to judge whether it's good or bad. Mm. In terms of standing up and having the confidence to say that it's something that I feel uh, it's easier to do now, although it's something that I've done throughout most of my life in different forms or another. I've always been a very much of a political animal. I've always been involved in demonstrations and protest. And so these things are fairly normal for me in terms of defining a path to go forward that may have been maybe different from what we've already trod. Mm -hmm. So that appeals i like that and i like looking around for resources in which to build a better path ahead of us in terms of the creativity um we've all got this in us and uh, we really all of us have this ability to express honestly who we are how we feel the way that we see the world and as long as we're not harming someone else in doing that, as long as our language or our actions don't inflict harm on other people, then we should not. I've lost the word. I've got it in Spanish, but I can't say it in English. Um, we shouldn't censor ourselves. You know, we should allow ourselves to express how we feel, how we see the world without worrying too much about how effective that is. And. I'd like to see more people doing it. I've seen you doing it. I've seen other people doing it with tremendous energy. And I think that's probably much more important than producing something original because, you know, we don't, none of us produce anything original. We're all copying, we're all borrowing, we're all, I like to use the phrase, you know, um, copying and pasting or tracing over other people's ideas and bringing them in and forging something new. That's how we evolve, that's how we learn. So do it, I'm doing it. I'm no more skilled than anyone else. I just don't really care what other people think about it. Very well. Um, yeah, I think that was the key uh, where you said, um, I, I think as long as you're honest with how you're presenting your material, then there's really no problem. It's up to everyone to evaluate you on their own, uh, on their own uh, what, what they're looking for. So as long as you say, hey, I'm not a champ. I'm not, I'm this guy. Here's who I am. I'm not got nothing to hide. I'm not trying to put on airs here. Here's what I'm offering. If you like that and you feel like you can grow from that, then let's work together. And the minute you can't, then no hard feelings, then move on. 
it's the people who try to present it with some type of uh, <laughs> fraud in mind, like, oh, I'm greater than I am, or I'm better than I am, or you're, I'm telling you that you're lesser than I than you are. Uh, well, perhaps, perhaps I should have added beforehand that I do have direct lineage back to Lao Tzu. And before that, I think probably to the first amphibian that ever emerged from the ocean. So I've got a long lineage behind me that can back up everything I have to say. I see. You're the uh, 116th generation. That's me. That's me. I've holder. got the certificate somewhere. Where is it? In land foo. You made it to land. Hey, good job. <laughs> <laughs> I think at some point our uh, lineage is crossed. I think we're connected then. I think we're all there. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I, I'm exclusive. I, I am the only authentic, real, original lineage that's still in existence today, which is why it's a waste of time going to anyone else's classes. Very well. <laughs> There's your commercial right there. How do you like that? <laughs> um, yeah, well, you say that everybody has that ability to express themselves, and, and I would like to believe that. Yeah, um, but? but so many people, well, what if your true nature is to uh, just follow? What if, you know, that is who you are? My, I don't think you can help but express yourself through this vessel, whoever you are and your, your sounds and your shape. Your expression, whatever you're doing, is always going to be uniquely yours anyway, whether you like it or not. Um, my slam dunk looks a lot different than LeBron James's slam dunk. They're both slam dunks, but and if I'm trying to be just like him, it's always going to be me. The trick is to make sure that you acknowledge, like, I'm not LeBron James. This is me doing my version of a slam dunk. And I own that and I'm okay with that and I see it for what it is as opposed to thinking I'm just like him or it's better to be like him because that's when you get into psychological troubles and stress. So uh, again, I think, again, the, one of the biggest reasons I love martial arts is that it's, it's in its best forms, it's honest. As a teacher, you should be very honest about what you can do and what you're offering. And as a student, you have to be very honest about what, what you want <laughs> and who your teacher is and how are you doing? And where are you on that journey? I mean, where do you stand? Um, mm -hmm. Where are you making progress? Where do you have shortcomings? Where are you going to be limited forever? And where can you actually make uh, progress, even if you and originally you didn't think you could? I think a good teacher helps people convert those ideas of like, oh, I could never jump that high, like slam a basketball. But a teacher might say, you have a limiting belief that I think we can break through. I actually think, by the way, you're eight foot tall. I'm pretty sure you can slam a basketball. I don't know who can who hurt you, but let's work on that together. Hopefully as a teacher, you have enough experience to be able to see more than a student can. And that's where the faith comes in to say, hey, see what I can do? I, I didn't used to be able to do this either. You're feeling low right now, but I'm telling you, you can do this. Put a little faith in this time period together and let's let's get you there together. So that's where there's a little bit of a, a synergy of everything we're talking about here, right? Uh, Honestly. I'm, slightly, I'm slightly concerned about the idea of the when we're involved in student recruitment, there's this idea that the way that we win more students is by promoting ourselves as being different from our competitors. And part of that difference, otherwise, why not just say to everyone who came to you, yeah, well, I'm exactly the same as everyone else. My school's identical. There's got to be something unique about your school that you feel is unique, that you feel is individual and that other schools do not share. Mm -hmm. So in this field of competition that's out there, it's very difficult, I think, for us sometimes to be as honest as we'd like, because we are concerned that if your livelihood comes from the number of students that come in through your front door, mm -hmm. then to some extent, there is this underlying sense of, it's easy to put down other schools or competition or other groups because the more you can do that, the more you'll hold your students to your school and the more that they won't go and, uh, and investigate those other styles. Do you see, there's this, no, I mean, perhaps I'm just projecting this onto the world of martial arts and that everyone is harmonious and mutually supportive and not competitive in any level. But there is a, a part of this, you know, that's still out there. Come on, admit it, Ando. I've seen you. Oh, well, there's business practices for sure. I think, I, I'm, I'm, to be clear, are you pointing out 
which which way would makes better business sense to identify yourself as someone very different who's doing something in a unique way or that you're the traditional one who's doing it the right way uh, from the authority paradigm like no no this is krav maga this is from the original yeah. you know israeli yeah. forces versus yeah. here's my take on krav maga it's ando's krav maga let's say which one of those do you think is the better uh, business play in today's world which one do i think yeah I mean, you're doing your own thing. Well, I'm right. clearly doing my own thing. I haven't got, I don't have that lineage. I can't say, you know, hey, come to me and you'll get the authentic stuff. I dress exactly the same as a 18th century Chinese feudal peasant, you know, and I only ever talk in Mandarin to my students. So we are authentic. Don't right. even think you're going to get a lesson in English. So, no, there's none of that business at all. It's, I left that in China, uh, not that I've been there. And most of the most people come to my classes say, so tell me about your Chinese teachers. And I say, well, I've had a, a Venezuelan and I've had an African teacher and I've had a couple of English guys and uh, a woman from you know, such and such. But I haven't been to China. I have no interest in going to China. Why would I need to think I need to go to China? This is crazy. What are you talking about? Um, and so, no, that that model of authenticity coming down to lineage and, uh, you know, the, the one true original is, for me, a dead model out there. It's not going anywhere. You have to adapt. You have to apply that individuality. You have to apply your personality in the way that you so successfully do yourself. You are the reference point for most of us, Ender. Oh, jeez. Wow. Whoa. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I was not prepared for a big compliment. Um, well, the truth is I'm a coward. There is so much I'm sitting on that I've never talked about or released or shown. Uh, but this is why talking to people like you is is inspiring because when I see you taking big big swings at uh, doing something very uniquely, I'm like, oh, well, that's cool. He, he's not, he's still alive. Nobody's come and dragged him out of his home. Oh, yeah. and him. No, uh, not yet. <laughs> but, um, but I do think... It's an interesting thought. I, I'll, I'll hope to read some comments if, when people uh, hear this. The traditional martial arts and having this whole challenge with the MMA world and um, and, and just having so much social media and the, the lessening of mystery in the martial arts, you can't get by anymore. It's like, well, he's from China, he's from Japan. And the mystique factor is so missing nowadays from when we came up in martial yeah. arts that um, – if you're just resting on, oh, well, this came from this particular teacher, from this particular lineage, and trust, oh, this is, you know, this is the real stuff, mystique, wink, wink, then I think traditional martial arts have been steadily declining, right? Even in the homelands, they've yeah. been steadily declining. So what is the alternative? What would make martial arts attractive again? It has to then come down to the, not the cult of personality, but the putting forth of your genuineness and your your accomplishments, which goes back to what we talked about demonstrating, if I can show maybe that I'm a happy guy and a, and a confident guy, um, this the same way I reasoned I started Kung Fu, like with Bruce Lee. I didn't care what style Bruce Lee did. I didn't actually in particular care for his movies, but I would see that guy and say, I like that guy. Man, he looks confident. Boy, I like the way he walks and talks to people. That guy's cool. I just want to be like that guy. And if he tells me that I should go do Wing Chun or if he tells me I'll go start there, but I also know that he's a very open-minded guy who eventually said, don't worry about the styles. Don't fuss over that stuff in names. It's about the journey and the philosophy and the work um, and being honest. So I think as a, as a, that's a good example of like even before – another example of why he's ahead of his time is that he wasn't a champion of a style. He was just a champion of, of being a person being uh, and demonstrating like here's who I am. I'm a confident guy who's going to show off the best I've got and follow me, baby. Follow me by doing your own thing is what I mean. Right. Yeah. The Chief Go isn't like, OK, do what he did when he was in the Chinatown years or do what he did when he was in his movies. No, no. Live like he lived. Don't try to follow his moves because that's his body and his temperament. Be also, you. He was a guy who didn't go through that that uh, conveyor belt, that factory of, you know, system of learning. He did Wing Chun for a while with your man in, in Hong Kong. And then he was on a boat to do San Francisco. And, you know, that sort of ended. That was the end of his sort of like martial arts. I mean, he continued it then when he met other people and learned and sparred and picked up other stuff. But when you look back and he had to say what his lineage was, well, he, you know, he was with your man for a bit, but yeah. And then one of the other things about him that people often get wrong is when he said, um, you put 
water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put it into a teapot, it becomes a teapot. Be like a teapot, my friend. Most people think he said, be like water, my friend. But I originally found out the original script for that, and it was, now I'm making this up as I go. Oh, wow, yeah. I, was waiting. <laughs> I, thought I'd, I thought I'd get the teapot bit in anyway. <laughs> The teapot monk rewriting history. Look at this. Uh, well, it's Bruce, Bruce, Bruce put me onto it. Be like a teapot, my friend. Be like a teapot, yeah. <laughs> That's excellent. Um, now, I know I, you have been, you've been very generous with your time. I think we just hit the hour mark. What? Uh, yeah, can you believe that? Holy smokes. Um, I know there were a couple other things we wanted to talk about today. Maybe we could just do that in a part two. Um, but I did want to say, people, uh, you, you are very prolific. Um, with with your with your content, you've already mentioned you've got books. Um, of all of your books, if I'm sitting at home and I love what you're saying right now, which book should I start with? If I want to know more about the Teapot Monk, which book? There is probably a book called the Manual of Bean Curd Boxing, and the strap line was uh, what was it? Tai Chi and the Noble Art of Leaving Things Alone. And it really was the first book. I wrote it in 2009, I think, or 2010. I can't remember. But anyway, it was the first Tai Chi book, I believe, for a very, very long time, if not forever. Certainly the only book in our solar system, from from what I'm told, (laughs) that describes Tai Chi without any photographs and lots of geometric pictures and footprints with arrows that go around showing you where to spin and what to do and how to hold your head and where your fingers should be on the side of your nose when breathing out. So it was really a a book of stories about how to apply the principles to the 21st century. And I think, as I mentioned to you before, it's, it's the book I feel of all the books I've written on Tai Chi, and I did end up having to do some with some pictures in, but this is the one that didn't. And I think it's certainly the most popular book I've written. Um, I have this driving need now as I reach the end of my life that I would love to that see that message go out further and further and people to look at it, to embrace it, to take what's useful, discard the rest. Who said that? Anyway, um, to utilize it in the way that they think best and adapt it into their lives, whatever their practices are, whether it be Kempo, whether it be uh, uh, MMA, or whether it just be uh, making plasticine models, however you like to live your life. So, yeah, that's why I was going to say to you, I'd love to give that book away and I'll give you a code where you can pick it up for nothing. And, uh, you know, as many people as possible, take it, do what you want with it, uh, burn it if you so wish. Be a bit difficult because it's a digital book. Um, uh, uh, so, yeah, please uh, have a taste of that. If you like the rest of it, then come along to my site. Uh, I think it's teapotmonk.com. Be funny if it wasn't. What is it? It's fightforhappylife.com. Oh, come on over. Sure. <laughs> sure, sure. Take it. Don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> You'll be brainwashed. Yeah. Uh, well, that's very generous of you. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes for sure. A link to uh, pick up the Teapot Monk's favorite book of his own. And if you like that book, uh, there are certainly others, other products, online courses. And um, and I would recommend going to your site directly. I'll put the link there to pick those up so you don't have to go through Amazon and give away a percentage. Why don't you help support the monk people? Come on now. Go to his site. Don't go to Amazon at this point. Is that fair? That's fair. Fair. <laughs> yes. Come on, let's do something. We've got to... Uh... We got to uh, embrace another world model, uh, especially after the elections here last week. Anyway, I won't go down that road. There's the politics. It's coming up. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, good for you. I mean, uh, you're a rabble rouser in the best sense of the word. Uh, you're you're rabble, engaged and uh, <laughs> no, I think you're doing a great job. I appreciate the inspiration. I truly do. I've got big plans as I head towards the end of my life as well here, and um, <laughs> I, I'm just waiting to pull the trigger. So. I appreciate seeing how you're testing the waters before me so I can see where the sharks are and I can maybe swim around that. While you're getting bloodied up, I can make a safe yeah. course. <laughs> Keep me pushing me out there first. Yeah, yeah, I got a pole. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but no, I thank you very much for making this time today, Sifu. Um, I, I, I'm looking forward to... What did you uh, call me? What did what you that? call me? What's Sifu? that? No, not Sifu. Monk? Sifu, I'm sorry. Mr. Monk? Did you prefer don't like seafood. Oh, I just got the finger. <laughs> I got the admonishment oh. finger. Better than the other one, but it's it's, it's just as hurtful. <laughs> you know me and titles. 
We well, never got onto the subject of names and titles, did we? Maybe another time. I think mean, you just made it clear. I think uh, a title is fine when someone offers it to you, not if you demand it from people, right? Is that okay? Well, I call it's your different. highness or your lordship. Why should you? <laughs> as long as you don't call yourself his lordship, I think it's okay. I think we should. I think we should move on. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I, there was a whole other topic I wanted to get to today, but why don't we just do a part two of this? Um, yeah. That that will yeah. make it easier. So you can move Maybe on. Maybe we should read comments on part one before deciding on part two. <laughs> well, let's see how this flies. Do I want to do it for myself? Uh, forget everyone else. First, it's oh, for me. Okay. Yeah, so I would sure. appreciate that. But uh, no, thank you very much for your time today, uh, Paul. Paul Allen Reed, thank you very much. I appreciate you making the time, sir. Uh, and uh, it's been a, it's been, it's been a, it's been a, you, you yeah. I it's been fantastic. It's been fantastic. Thank this you. Why I leave people speechless? Yes, blown away. <laughs> thank you, sir. All right. I don't know if you could tell, but I really did enjoy that conversation with Paul. I've already written down some topics that we can talk about next time. If you'd like to be part of this conversation, don't forget to leave a comment somewhere and let me know what you're thinking. Also, in the meantime, uh, don't forget to check out the show notes for that link to get your copy of the Manual of Bean Curd Boxing, Paul's book. Why would you miss that? Until next time, smiles up, my friend. Let that smile be your shield and your sword. Keep fighting for a happy life.